Hi class, so welcome to week seven. This uh, class is flying by and uh, everybody's doing such a great job. I appreciate all of you guys and uh, I hope you're enjoying class as much as I am. Sorry, you have to um, look at my ugly shed there. As you can see the rabbits like to hang out in there and the goats or baby goats are back there too. So my apologies for that. So, all right, so this week we are looking at art. Let me get this set up real quickly, guys. Come on now, there we go. I would say that above all the things that set us apart, from the uh, other species that we share this planet with. You know, art is def definitely, hands down, the one thing that is truly unique to us. You know, we like to say that culture is unique to being human. We like to say that using tools is unique to being human or something like that. Even language is unique to being human. However, you know, with more research that we have done, we see that, you know, there are lots of other animals that have culture and, and you know, they have language communication systems like uh, the spotted hyenas. They have a very advanced communication system. And even though, you know, they're not speaking in human and using words like we do, you know, it's it's their way of communicating. And then uh, it's also interesting too, uh, just on a side note, that uh, they are, scientists are working on uh, microchips to where uh, we can understand dolphin communication so they are actually working on devices so that they can turn the dolphins language into human language and uh, they're actually they're doing stuff like that with dogs too so anyway art so so you know so art is indeed the one thing that is exclusive to us i cannot think of any i mean you know you see those people that they give like chimpanzees paint brushes or they they let dogs birds paint but you know as far as you know what art is you know it's creation of imagination in many ways you know as many ways it's very realistic you have that realism art but at the same time we have that abstract art side and that is what the uh is the exclusive human element there because you know that abstract art we're tapping into those those unconscious levels of reality that are very deep 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 within our psyche right we're, we're tapping into fantasy we're tapping into creativity we're tapping in to imagination and and you know we're tapping into basically the unknown and uh you know that's where our art really explodes and we get to explore you know just how we think feel and go about being humans and you know other animals cannot do that yet anyway so when it comes to looking at art we see that we have a three we have a few basic elements actually i think there are five um but uh we have a, a few basic elements here so our first elements are that the art it needs to be creative so you know art it, like i said it's about understanding the human experience and it's it's about exploring kind of those more unknown aspects of life conscious reality spirituality emotions uh in many ways it's giving physical manifestation to those things because you know art is very uh very emotional based you know it's something that's playful um, and essentially art should be enjoyable, but you know, at the same time, art is also persuasive, political, you know, it, it, it can depict, it can be used to, uh, you know, depict the, those more extreme heinous sides of human nature, things like racism, things like, you know, rape, war, you know, that was one of the uh, big things with the Vietnam War is that, uh, um, art you know, really changed the way that uh, the civilian public views war. And it really changed the way that the uh, American people on the civilian side, you know, felt about supporting that war. And uh, maybe you guys, I'm sure you guys have seen it. Uh, if you've watched anything 
or read anything about Vietnam, the famous picture they always show is of the little naked girl who just got like a set on fire with napalm or something. And she's like on fire and kind of running down the road. And you see the American soldiers in the background. And then of course, you know, art in the form of uh, media. So, you know, TV, this is, you know, the Vietnam War was the first time in history that the civilian world got that every day up to date uh, kind of play by play of what was going on. You know, you got to think about it before that um, to hear about what happened in the war. It could take, you know, even even once we, once we got radio, it is updated a little bit. So you could get kind of daily, weekly uh, updates, you know, but go back to, let's say, like Gettysburg, the French Revolution, you know, all the revolutions that followed. The French Revolution, when you know the ending of slavery, you know those were the communication channels were very slow. That's a good way to say it because you know you just had people on horseback, or you had people on foot, or you know you had to cross the ocean with that letter to tell somebody what was going on, right? So, uh, so, so uh, once again, we see that that artistic process and uh, you know the output of that process. It takes many different shapes and form and the last thing i want to say about that first uh, element there is that when we talk about the artistic process we're also we're, we're talking about it from the perspective of ego so from from that individual that is the one who is creating the art and you know i think that's what i, I think that idea applies to anything that we do in life you know we want to pick jobs that that make us feel creative that make us feel playful that makes us feel that we enjoy, right? You know, make us feel happy. We want to have, you know, family and and friends in our life. You know, our social networks. We we want to have all those things involved. So you know, that's just part of being human too. And the whole part of you know, kind of kind of one of those main philosophical questions of you know, why are we here? And okay, since we are here, how do we make the most of it? You know, we would like. Plato, Confucian, they change, they they uh, term that as in what do we consider a good life? You know, one that brings us the most satisfaction and happiness. And art, in many ways, brings that to us. And so we see that step, that second element that I've already touched upon, and that's that emotional reaction that art uh, in. And, you know, this week, I feel like uh, we're talking exclusively probably more about a visual, uh, uh, yeah, visual arts, I was going to say a little bit performance arts, too, because, you know, there's some theater plays, theatrical elements involved in that. But at the same time, um, next week, we'll go more into that because next week, we're going to look at music and dance. And those are definitely art forms that follow that that not follow but contain all of these basic elements too and then lastly as far as the element on this slide goes art needs to be transformational and uh, <clears throat> and so art is transformational because you're taking something and making it into something else and then art is trans uh formative because of that emotional aspect you know art can change mindsets it can change cultures it can change you know the way we live it can change our emotional state so i think we see i uh, the thing that pops in my mind when i think of that transformational side would be kind of like buddhist mandalas because you know there's a lot of uh, the creation of the creation of those and then the like a uh, symbology in those that relate to uh, kind of transforming our mindsets and things of that nature second because guys my dog's locked in the house and he's going nuts All right, so next, art should also be informational and it should, uh, 
it should indicate some kind of collective um, experience, quality, you know, it has to have that uh, collective appeal. There's, there's a good word for it. It has that collective appeal so that it can be shared equally by all people in a society like I have there on the slide. And then for the most part, art is informational and it's representational, meaning that there's some type of symbolism that is being portrayed. And you know, that's where we start looking into modern art and things start getting a little fuzzy. That was a whole uh, point of like the uh, surrealism movement and the, uh, it was called a Dada movement. Back at the turn of the century, I guess maybe 20s, 30s, 40s, I guess is uh, if my brain is serving me quite correctly, some, somewhere in that time frame, we saw these art movements. And it was basically the idea of just, uh, you know, creating art out of nothing, creating art out of trash, you know, just, just taking things that you wouldn't find artistic or tasteful and, uh, you know, presenting that in this artistic way. And a lot of it was a pretty uh, existential kind of a nihilist view sets because, you know, we just had these major world wars. And so, you know, that changed the way people viewed reality and, and uh, you know, people were very, especially like after World War One, very lost, very confused, very much questioning what is reality and so uh, you know we start to see that reflected in art and so my point with that with that example is that uh you know since then we, we call that modern history so i guess we can consider that modern art right with modern art we start to see more of a non functional implication of art i hope this is making sense you guys know what i'm talking about like somebody will have like a toilet and it's painted gold and that's the art piece or somebody will take like a piece of parchment you know like the brown packaging tape you wrap your packages to ship them in and they'll take that and they'll frame it and then sell it for like thirty thousand dollars and it's supposed to be art and you know i guess uh i i guess that's where we see that uh that representational part of art and and you know that idea that it needs to be equal with that collective Art, uh, we start to see divisions there because, you know, I, I guess maybe that appeals to people in different groups or different classes of society that I don't really understand. But uh, I think you guys get my part. And, you know, art is as dynamic and extreme and just all the things that, that you think about when you think about what it means to be human is definitely all put into this little ball and uh, called art, right? And then with a lot of art, you know, we, we uh, like to combine them. So like I said, next week, we'll talk a little bit more about that kind of uh, the performance, the theatrical side of it with the music and dance. But um, a lot of artwork, you know, it is it does work in tandem. So, you know, you come up with a painting and then that inspires some type of uh, theatrical performance. So, you know, that empire, that painting inspires a song and inspires a poem and inspires a, a, a dance piece. And, you know, once again, it just goes to show that dynamicism of being human. And I would also argue that it goes to show our, our just uh, natural human instinct is to be together you know, as humans, we're social creatures and we need each other to survive. And so when we th see things like, you know, different people combining their artistic talents together, you know, that's a, that's a coupling of that uh, basic social um, essence that we possess. Yeah, I guess it's in our DNA. Maybe it's in our uh, deep within our uh, conscious, unconscious somewhere. I don't know, but interesting to think about, right? how art creates togetherness so uh and then when we start looking at different types of art forms you know i've already kind of said this we we know that there is variety there and a lot of time we see team dis we team 
we tend to see in smaller scale societies, smaller scale, excuse me, societies, we have this highly portable art, or in basically what's that thing like sometimes it's this big flashy kind of art, you know, it's this stuff like like the uh, Easter Island. Um, I'm pretty sure that's Easter Island where you see these uh these elaborate like monuments sculptures things like the uh, anasazi law uh, uh desert lines down in uh, south america i can't remember where but uh you know they, they're like some of those they're like birds i think maybe one some type of reptile and you know some of them aliens <laughs> if you go with uh von daniken there but uh you know my point is is these kind of large kind of flashy uh, 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 art pieces that, you know, kind of can be seen, um, and, and, you know, on these large scale views, and I, that's all another, that's one of the ancient alien things, but that's another, that's a, another discussion, right, guys, and then what we tend to see is once we start to get more complex societies, we get that greater, uh, division of labor and what we call specialization of labor and specialization is just that it's a you know you you know everybody in society has a function and you figure that out based on their skill set so you know you have the religious leaders you have the people who do the artwork because that's their special gift you have the people who make the clothes you have the merchants you have the uh the the slave class you know so on and so forth you see that special life and a lot of times in complex society, art is something that's more, you know, in the past, like I said, modern art has definitely uh, broken down these old paradigms that, you know, art is only for kind of the affluent, the elite, the rich people. <laughs> you know, that was a big thing of how archaeology began in getting all those artifacts. And, you know, those artifacts were considered pieces of art and they were coveted pieces of art that you know all the rich people in europe were fighting over to you know to have that in their collection and then you know at that time archaeology was still called anti antiquarianism and it's like antiquing basically a, a, like a real complicated way of saying that but you know looking at these artifacts as antiques and uh so uh they had been these early museums buying for these pieces too and uh so like i said though and, and well you know even into modern ages probably even in like the 20s we still kind of see before uh before the great depression we still kind of see this the elitist idea associated with art and then even you know if we want to jump back a few centuries to the beginning of a contact in the age of exploration in the 1400s when Europe first started going out, you know, in addition to, uh, you know, they were looking for spices, they were looking for gold, they were looking for Christians. I believe it was, um, I think it was Marco Polo who said that when he first got to like a Calcutta or something. And they laughed at him and they're like, well, you'll find the uh, spices, but you're not gonna find any Christians here kind of funny story but um you know art is my point was a big part of of, of uh, those movements too you know especially once we finally got to china and uh they saw these uh, beautiful porcelain pieces that they made there and these beautiful silk things that they made and then even their art these beautiful artworks that they made on you know the, the way that they do it and you know those were coveted things that all the rich people wanted basically, you know, but like I said, my, you know, more uh, so into the modern world and with things like industrialism and consumerism, we start now, you know, getting this kind of mass reproduction of artwork. So, you know, I would uh, say that uh, even more so than globalization, consumerism has changed a way that we view art in a way that uh, art is, uh, produced as it not not massly but just produced from the individual as you as the artist what i mean that you know that has definitely changed and then at the same time we see a lot of that reproductionism right you know that's that's the big thing to get that get the poster of da vinci or you know the mona lisa so you too can have that art piece on your wall you know that's all 
that's all psychology of consumerism where they appeal to our emotions and use these these old symbolism and these old uh you know um famous historical examples of what is artwork you know that's the way that they appeal to us to get our money so it's interesting that you know when it comes down to being human i say that art is probably what's what is the only indicative thing separating us from other species but in all actuality you know this idea of uh bargaining and money that uh you know we see in some other uh, other primates that they do have this kind of idea of sharing and reciprocity so they've done studies with like the rhesus monkeys and they see that they uh they, they understand like, uh, you know, in order to get them to do a task, they'll be rewarded with something. So like, say you give them a break, or if you have two of them together beside each other and you make one do a task and, you know, you don't give him the grape until he does the task, he'll do the task and take the grape. But if you go over here to the next cage and you go and you just give that monkey a grape, don't make him do anything. That first one realizes is like, hey, wait a minute. Why did I have to work for that? And you just gave that to him. So they like, they'll throw a fit. And then we've also seen, a, it's not Reese's, I can't remember the other type of monkey they use, but um, or uh, other primate. But they did these studies with uh, the idea of sharing. And so they saw like, uh, they didn't, you know, when food sources are low and one found, a, a, like say they found a nut and uh, he wasn't able to get the nut open, then like another one would come along and provide a hammer and then they would both equally share. So once again, my point with sharing that example is this idea goes back to this idea of, uh, you know, art is exclusive to us as human beings. And it's just interesting to see how with the way that, you know, since industrialism in the beginning of, you know, mass society and this idea of consumerism, that things like art have, uh, you know, changed too. And I guess that's just part of it because, you know, change is a part of life. And enough of that platform, right? So then uh, it's also interesting to see that, you know, art is such a part of being humans that, uh, you know, it goes way, way back into our prehistory. And so this is just kind of a, this, this is not prehistoric art piece. This is a depiction of uh, early Homo erectus. And, you know, that is uh, probably the first humanoid um, that we consider to be our direct ancestors. But, you know, even if we go a little farther back and we look at, say, like Neanderthal, or we look at uh, um, the prehistoric, uh, like Southeastern Indians here in the Southeastern United States, this is where I focus my uh, master's thesis on in many, in many respects. I was looking at mound building, but, uh, you know, that that's kind of a form of art too, in many ways. So uh, my point is, is that even as far back as Neanderthal, we see some form of artistic expression with being human. And then, uh, you know, once again, we say that that uh, art provides us with information. It's representational. So, you know, based on these artifacts and these fossil evidence of our early um, um human ancestors, I guess we can say, um, we, we then, you know, conjure up these visual artistic images of how we think they lived their life. So uh, just an interesting picture and idea to talk about. And then uh, just a little bit more about some prehistoric art. So, you know, like I said, a lot of these artifacts were considered pieces of art. And uh, when it comes to archaeology, archaeology, these Achuian hand axes, um, we, we definitely think that they were uh, some type of symbolic, probably used ritually, symbolically. We really don't know, but you know, that that's kind of part of the process of looking at history and prehistory is we get to use our imaginations. Of course, we don't want to go too far into the imaginary realm, right? But, uh, you know, we definitely see from these artifacts that uh, there's definitely they, they weren't just utilitarian in nature, and we say that because as archaeologists, you look at the way it's made, and then you can tell if it's been used to do certain things. And a lot of these Acheulean axes, you know, they seem ceremonial because it doesn't look like they were used to kill anything, cut anything. You can see, um, like little, uh, I guess they would be like scars on the rocks. You know, you can look under a microscope and kind of see those kind of cool stuff and you 
get into the uh, lab part of archaeology there. But my point with this is just just once again, you know, we see that art is definitely it, it has to be some kind of fundamental element of being human, and that uh, you know this this symbolic side of life is just something that is uh, it's it's like rooted very deeply in our DNA. So then that leads us uh, to think, uh, to, to kind of sum up those functions of art. So we looked at those elements, we were, we were talking about the purpose and essentially we were talking about the function. So, you know, we have that emotional, the social, and then um, kind of that, just like I said, that informational representational because we want to challenge something we want to preserve something we want to imagine what something looked like right and then uh when it comes to those ideas of the functions of art you know we have this idea of liberation theater and uh you know it's just those theatrical productions that go about bringing social change what are they called like those uh uh, since the 50s doing like, like the big knit beat knit type things but now they have it to where it's like like the spoken poetry there's a specific word for that movement I can't it's it's on the top of my tongue once again guys sorry you know my old brain I can't remember everything but uh like like you know most of those will go with spoken poetry those those performances are like the ones um you see and it'll be somebody like uh, they'll maybe have a word and then they'll kind of act out this little scene. And it's all about that idea of bringing about some type of social change, uh, 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 you know, expanding social consciousness. And then, of course, we have graphic and plastic arts. And so with graphic arts, Max, no, Max, stay here, Max. Sorry, guys, my dog's running in the road. Maximus. Get back over here, now. Sorry guys, I hope I'm still recording. Okay, good. Sorry guys, welcome to my world. It's really hard for me to make these videos. I try to say, I've tried to do them where I lock everybody in the house or I lock everybody outside and lock me in the house and it just never works. Like. This is my life. I have a bunch of animals. So I just got to do them best I can, right? So graphic arts, painting, drawing, and, you know, we can actually include uh, the computer graphics now, I do believe. And then we have those plastic arts, and that's basically, you know, the ones where you're using some type of medium to turn it into something else. So, you know, clay, wood, glass, um, metal, thing, leather, things of those nature. And then uh, when it comes to art, because it does show that kind of uh, spectrum of human personality, human behavior, human emotions, humor is a big part of art too. So, you know, there's a whole kind of movement for art of humor and, uh, you know, it, it kind of serves those same functions. You know, you have satirical art. Um, I think a lot of, uh, um, political art that's very satirical in many ways a lot of the uh, propaganda type art that we have seen over the centuries you know some of that has been used kind of humorously satirically we look at a lot of uh, art and propaganda in my history class so that's kind of what comes to mind when I think of, of that and then you know because art conveys that um that that spectrum and diversity of being human you know sometimes we need to laugh and uh, you know art can provide that uh, kind of escapism for us and then when it comes to thinking about that that variation of art and human behavior uh, um when it comes to looking at art cross culturally and even looking at things like humor cross culturally you know we want to be educated on other cultures so that we can understand what they're saying and you know that's especially crucial with humor and i think it's because of that last point there exclusively is because you know 
if you go somewhere else and you don't understand what is being said as human beings, we tend to automatically go with, they're laughing at me. Is everybody laughing at me? Oh no, everybody's going to laugh at me. And you know, ha ha, that's funny to think about in itself. But I, you know, I think there's something to that in my philosophy class, we do a question and it's a, uh, you know, if, if you had the ability to become invisible, you know, what would you do? Would you, you do what would society consider what you would do unethical? You know, think about the story of the invisible man and some of the things that uh, he does. He does some very uh, public unethical things like stalking a woman. And, and I do believe he does sexually assault her. I believe that's in the book, too. I know it's in the Kevin Bacon movie version. But I think that's straight from the book. But, uh, you know, so so my point is, is that, you know, uh, the first that as human beings, we, that's what I hear a lot with that question is people are like, I don't want to be able to observe what other people say about me behind my back so that I could know what they're saying about me. And I'm like, no, you probably don't want to know what other people are saying about you because it doesn't matter what other people are saying about you behind your back and then to end that point I have a saying that uh if I can't laugh at myself I can't laugh at anybody else <laughs> my husband's like wait a minute that's not right I'm like no it's just that idea of having a sense of humor and you know you got to be able to laugh at yourself sometimes too right so of course we see that uh you know art it's as various as numerous numious too that's a a, a saying or a, a term uh, psychologist Carl Young coined to uh, talk about archetypes. You know, those are those like those those symbol symbolic uh, kind of roles we take on: father, mother, lover, warrior, brother, sister. Right, and they're numious because because they create kind of a they they conjure up feelings deep inside of us. And so, in many ways, art does that too. And so, we know that it's subject to internal and external forces of change. So, you know, it's going to change depending on what is popular, what's going on socially, what are the major belief systems going on at that time. And then at the same time, there are gonna be, uh, you know, it's going to change in regards or as, a, as an opposition, as a, a statement, a defense against whatever those social external forces are. And then externally, you know, art's going to change for, uh, for the artists, and you know, Da Vinci is a good one, Picasso is a, a good one to think about, because you know, we see different periods in their life, you know, who I think believe it was Picasso, he had the whole blue period because of his depression, right, I believe that was Picasso, or you know, Picasso, he liked to draw a lot of naked women, right, weirdly shaped naked women, but uh, at the same time, you see different periods um, when, when he was painting those and, and, you know, get a kind of a feel of maybe the different emotions he was going through. See that with a lot of Cubanism type art in general, I would actually uh, argue with that. So, you know, art is going to change based on what's going on inside the artist, based on what's going on in that outside, uh, um, that outside and environment and then like i said you know because of industrialization because of things like consumerism globalization just you know the fact that as a world and uh, as different cultures we are connected more so than ever we definitely see art changing and uh, one of the good things about that is we have cultural diffusion so you know we have sharing of different arts and artwork and that's a good thing because that helps keep one-sided so go back to when contact first happened so the european explorers some of their artwork some of their journal entries of uh, say their encounters with the native american are vastly different than what we see from the native american side of it so you know the explorer side is as they were these you know these great saints coming in to save these people and their pictures of, you know, they're on all shiny on their horses and, you know, maybe crosses around to show, you know, how great they are. And uh, the Indians are just kind of falling down at their feet and everybody's happy, lovey dovey. And then you see a picture that, say, one of the uh, 
Native American artists made, and that and, and it's vastly different. It's you know the 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 conquistadors are wielding their their swords, and there's blood all over the place, and hacked up bodies on the ground, and you know we come to know now that that was indeed more the reality of what was going on. But you see, my 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 um my point there is that uh, cultural diffusion and uh, our ability to communicate with each other is a good thing because it helps give us more understanding of the facts. So as much as uh, I feel like I've probably been focused more on that abstract um, kind of reality, uh, no, abstract depiction, depictionization that art provides, you know, at the same time, there is definitely a lot of realism in, in, in involved in that too. And then because of cross-cultural connections, we see mixing of different artistic um, traditions. I would definitely say, well, we'll probably talk uh, with um, um, art. We probably see that more in the form of like music and dance. You know, there's definitely a call to, I would say, and uh, our modern world for people to get back in touch with their indigenous roots. So we see this resurgence of maybe um, tribal dancing, uh, this resurgence of interest in, in you know, indigenous um, music things of that nature, right? And then uh, because of uh, our ability to, uh, uh, or, or because of the evolution of transportation systems, art doesn't just exist in a museum anymore. You know, think back to what I said about archeology span and it beginning as antiquitarianism. That was that big thing, you know, museums, uh, Thing like the American National History Museum, you know, for a long time, they held the monopoly over art because it's like you want to see these pieces, you had to go to them. And, uh, you know, with our communication and our transportation channels opening up like they have in the 20th to 21st century, now, you know, art is able to come to us. And, you know, that that's really a good thing from the globalization, cross-cultural perspective because you know we're able you know many cultures are able to keep their cultural traditions alive because they can sell their artwork to, to people in other parts of the world right and so that then goes into kind of that educational side that art provides too and it's very interesting too because as as diverse as we is as human beings and as varied as we are emotionally, behaviorally, um, we also see a lot of continuity at times. So as much as we have seen art change over the centuries, take on its own life forms, we also see kind of this uh, kind of a, a circling back around on itself too. And so, you know, there's a lot of stuff, especially nowadays, that we consider modern art and it's very closely related to our ancient art so you see here i have the uh one uh, i have a cave painting from uh, the thousands tens of thousands of years ago and then you know on top there is that picture of modern artwork and and you know i think the commonality we see there is simplicity simplicity in form and simplicity in thought and expression and uh, i think that kind of and then, uh, and, and then, on uh, many ways, that idea of continuity, also a uh, collaboration, comes in there because uh, you know that's the way we see art surviving and art changing too. It goes back to that idea that as human beings, essentially, you know, fundamentally, we we can't exist without each other, and we need each other to be different for us to grow and evolve and survive. And so uh, we see globalization, you know, poses, uh, poses threats to our very human nature because in many ways it is trying to kind of force of this monoculture on people. It kind of wants us all, wants everybody to dress in, you know, Old Navy, eat at McDonald's, drink Starbucks and, and you know, believe the same things in many ways, you know, and, and I just feel like that is just humanly impossible. We will never all be the same unless they find a way to drug us all up so that, you know, our, our ability to independently think goes away. But, you know, until that time, they'll never make us all the same because as humans, it means 
that we're different. And that's the beautiful thing about being human. And that is definitely something that we see expressed in our art. And so to end us there, I just want to, uh, one last little thing that, you know, globalization, it is threatening traditional art. A lot of traditional art has been lost, but at the same time, that that may be a fleeting, a fleetingness of art. Uh, maybe it's not something that should be around forever. It's supposed to come, teach us what it needs to teach, and then we're supposed to move on and evolve. And we see that in such uh, artistic expressions as with the Australian Aborigines or say with like a uh, Tibetan and Buddhist cultures where they make the mandala which is there on the left side of the screen you know traditionally the way those are made is they're not supposed to be permanent you know you sit down in the sand and and they will you know spend hours maybe even days you know making that that mandala you see right there out of sand and the purpose was you know you make it you attune to the energy and then you erase the sand and you start over and do something else you know it's not art is not supposed to be permanent it's supposed to teach a lesson and then we're supposed to evolve interesting point to end on and so on the right is just a picture of the australian dream time which is kind of explains their understanding of consciousness reality and uh, basically in, in a in a very very small nutshell this real world that we call waking consciousness is more kind of like the dream world and uh we're all kind of shadows of ourselves nature it's kind of all shadows like the ancestors, they came, they created this world, the animals came, created this world, and then they all went to the real world. So even when you see animals, that's why animals were so important to them, because it was the shadow side that represents the uh, the, the real animals in the other world, you know, teaching us lessons, and you can connect to that other world when you go to sleep. But like I said, that's a real simple nutshell version of that, and, and it's way more complicated than that but i end with that because i love this picture it's a beautiful depiction of australian aborigines belief and that's uh you know we we say they didn't have they don't have a written language because a lot of how they conveyed information to each other was through making these uh pictures very much like they would make mandalas in the sand and you would make these this picture you would tell the story in the sand and then they would erase it. And so that was a big thing of why uh, we don't really know a lot about their culture in particular, because uh, when we started having contact, they wouldn't divulge to, to the Europeans, to the Westerners, what a lot of these pictures meant. So there we go. Art is, uh, it's, it's depicting, you know, our reality. It depicts our unreality <laughs> of consciousness our unconsciousness and you know maybe even the subconscious that lies there <laughs> and art you know and whether it's supposed to be something that lasts forever and ever or whether it's supposed to be something that uh you know we take it for what it is kind of get that snapshot and then move on you know art is definitely something that represents the human experience and the here and now and all the various things that come along with that. So thanks for watching, guys. That ends our lecture for this week. As always, if you need anything, please do not uh, hesitate to reach out. I was going to say, don't reach out to me. <laughs> please do not hesitate to reach out to me, guys. I appreciate all of you and uh, keep up the great work for these uh, next few weeks. We just have what? two about uh, uh nine weeks so we just got a couple more weeks left in class guys need any help with those research topics please let me know all right thanks guys bye